Buonasera, posso cominciare allora Davide? Io chiedo. Vai. Vado. Allora, buonasera a tutti, eh, persone che si sono collegate su Zoom e quelle che ci seguono eh, via Facebook, eh, benvenuti. Eh, diciamo, da un lato eh, non siamo felici perché avremmo voluto che questa eh, serie di conferenze che si inaugura oggi qui alla Fondazione Zeri eh, fosse una serie di conferenze che avremmo potuto fare in presenza e naturalmente dispiace dover usare questo mezzo. Dall'altra però dobbiamo dire che questo mezzo consente di avere alla Fondazione Zeri nel giro di poche settimane una serie di eh, persone, cioè Claudia Chirisa Gersh che c'è oggi che ringrazio e poi Anlis Dema e, e quindi Chirà dal Buquerc che difficilmente saremmo riusciti a, a, a riunire in tempi così stretti e, ed avere a Bologna. Quindi, come dire, cerchiamo di prendere il meglio da questa situazione difficile. Eh, abbiamo intitolato questa piccola serie Collezioni a domicilio, e cioè ehm, avremo tre incontri con tre persone, con tre eh, colleghe, tre amiche, che sono curatrici di grandi collezioni di scultura, abbiamo scelto di occuparci di scultura in questa occasione eh, nel mondo, e cioè Dresda, eh, Los Angeles e Londra. Mi fa molto piacere che noi oggi cominciamo con Claudia Crisa Gersh. Claudia Crisa Gersh è curatrice della scultura rinascimentale, della scultura barocca, delle eh, Skulpturen Sammlung di Dresda, e, ehm, dove lavora ormai da qualche anno, eh, ma Claudia ha alle spalle una carriera prestigiosissima, eh, una carriera che è cominciata con i suoi studi a Vienna, il suo dottorato a Vienna, ma poi Claudia ha lavorato eh, negli Stati Uniti, eh, prima a, a Washington dal 97 al 2000, alla National Gallery, poi al Metropolitan per studiare i bronzi mh, veneziani del Rinascimento, a Baltimora, e poi dal 2003 al 2013 per dieci anni è stata curatrice della scultura al Consistorisches Museum di Vienna, quindi vedete un percorso prestigiosissimo. Nel corso di questi anni ha, ha curato, ha lavorato e curato mostre importanti come quella sull'antico con Eleonora Luciano e Denis Allen che si tenne in America, mi pare nel 2011, e a Dresda quella... Shadow of Time, quella dedicata appunto alla, al giovane Gian Bologna, al rapporto di Gian Bologna con Michelangelo. Eh, Claudia è, è una grande studiosa di scultura del Rinascimento e si è occupata di moltissimi argomenti da Desiderio da Settignano fino a Pompeo Leoni, ma il fuoco direi degli, degli studi di Claudia è, è, è probabilmente Venezia. È Venezia, la scultura veneziana del Cinquecento, eh, a Claudia dobbiamo ehm, davvero contributi molto molto importanti su eh, Tiziano Aspetti e Niccolò Rocca Tagliata e più in generale sui bronzi del Rinascimento a Venezia, credo aspettiamo da Claudia una monografia su Tiziano Aspetti, io e Claudia ci siamo conosciuti qualche anno fa durante la mostra su Alessandro Vittoria che si tenne a Trento nel 1999, quindi un po' di tempo fa, e appunto ci siamo conosciuti lì dove Claudia ha, ha curato la parte bellissima su, su Aspetti e, e Rocca Tagliata. Mi fa piacere che cominciamo con Dresda, perché Dresda è un museo forse non così conosciuto oggi dal pubblico italiano, eppure è un museo così italiano, un museo così italiano per le collezioni che ospita e perché, come sappiamo tutti, è un museo che in qualche modo deve qualcosa all'Italia, non solo per le opere, ma perché alla metà del Settecento è Francesco Algarotti che per Augusto III di Sassonia stende proprio il programma di una galleria dando già, come dire, le coordinate di quello che è il museo moderno, cioè un museo ordinato non solo per accostamenti generici, ma ordinato appunto per epoche e per scuole. Quindi diciamo un, uno dei primi musei moderni e quindi sono veramente felice che eh, noi oggi ne possiamo parlare con Claudia. Non le voglio sottrarre altro tempo, le do la parola e quando poi avrai finito credo che potremo avere delle, eh, potranno esserci delle domande. Quindi Claudia ti ringrazio per essere qui con noi oggi e ti do la parola. Benissimo, grazie mille Andrea. Ok, io comincio, ecco qui ci siamo.
Eccomi. Ah. <ride> Buonasera a tutti e grazie mille Andrea di, di aver organizzato questa splendida serie di interventi uh, per curare tutti noi un po' della nostra nostalgia che non possiamo essere assieme e non possiamo visitare i musei. Um, e, um, sono molto molto contenta e felice che posso parlare su Dresda. Uh, perché, um, come hai detto tu, giustamente, è una città molto italiana, uh, piena di arte italiana, um, e ha um, collezioni stupendi, ma fino ad oggi non è riuscito di essere uno dei primi musei del mondo, come il Metropolitan, il Louvre, ma Dresda ha proprio um, uh, uh, una collezione che sarebbe allo stesso livello, ma non, non dobbiamo dimenticare che era per decenni dietro uh, uh, una frontiera molto dura uh, uh, e fino ad oggi non è entrato proprio uh, uh, nella mente della, della gente in generale che esiste questa bellissima città con queste stupende collezioni. Um, i will continue adesso in inglese perché purtroppo sono anni che non sono stato in Italia e il mio italiano non è, non è, sono un po' fuori di pratica um, e così parlerò in inglese. Credo, chiedo scusi ma credo che è um, meglio per noi tutti. Uh, allora, cominciamo uh, 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 con uh, la collezione delle sculture a Dresda. Uh, benvenuto a Dresda. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Dresden. Uh, uh, I'm starting with the view of the famous Frauenkirche, also to give you an idea um, how much has been rebuilt during these last years. Uh, so um, everything that was destroyed in the Second World War uh, around the Frauenkirche has been reconstructed, not entirely historically correct, uh, uh, but um, uh, uh, the impression, the overall impression is truly uh, magnificent. Um, and I want to direct your direction to the building to, on the left side, this one here, uh, which uh, houses today the Museum for Traffic, uh, which is not very exciting, um, but uh, it's a um, museum that is historically, the building is very important because when you look on this painting by Bernardo Bellotto from uh, the middle of the 18th century, you see the same building to the left. Uh, and this building was um, at that time, the house of the paintings gallery. So this is where the son of Augustus the Strong uh, housed uh, the collection. And he is actually just arriving in his magnificent carriage uh, to visit his collection. So you see him here. Uh, uh, he is arriving and he, won he will then go up the stairs. Um, and here on the first floor used to be the paintings. In the ground floor of this museum uh, very, uh, was later housed the collection of plaster casts uh, that were bought towards the end of the 18th century. And it was a very famous collection because it was the collection of plaster casts owned by Anton Raphael Mengs in Rome. Uh, so already in the 18th century, this museum had a structure that we sort of wanted to recreate. So you had in the ground floor antiquities, because the plaster casts by from Mengs were mostly after antique sculpture. So you saw the foundation for every good art. And in the first floor, you then was um, you could then study um, the art that was influenced by antiquity, so the old masters. Uh, so here is um, uh, the portrait of um, the, um, the prince we just saw arriving in the carriage, uh, Frederick Augustus II. Uh, he was the son of Augustus the Strong and is mostly overshadowed by the enormous popularity of Augustus the Strong. But as a collector, particularly of paintings and sculpture, he was actually much more important than his father. Uh, here you see him as a beautiful um, young prince. Uh, uh, on the left side, uh, you see uh, the portrait bust by uh, Coudray. Uh, and uh, on, the left, on the right side, the painting by Hyacinthe Rigaud. So you see, uh, in the time of Augustus um, the Strong, it was also the court, the whole policy of culture at the uh, Saxon court was very much directed towards 
France in the beginning. So they wanted to have French artists and copy the French style of her holding court. Uh, and this was then soon to change. Uh, so here you have um, um, Frederick's um, August, Augustus II in uh, 30 years later in a beautiful pastel um, by Anton Raphael Mengs. Uh, so I'm always fighting for the forgotten heroes, uh, and he is my big friend. I love him. Uh, here is Augustus the Strong himself, of course, who transformed Dresden into uh, this splendid residence um, uh, in the Baroque uh, time, uh, and who um, collected really on a very, very um, um, grand scheme. Uh, he's mostly known, for example, for establishing the famous Green Vault, uh, which is a museum for, uh, it's, it's sort of a big treasury you can walk into. Uh, why it's called Green Vault becomes pretty obvious because the walls were painted green. Uh, uh, and uh, this also completely um, uh, uh, restored uh, historical collection is today can be seen um, in the castle in Dresden. So this is the castle of Dresden. Uh, and here on the ground floor on this side, this is where the green, the historic green vault um, can be visited today. Um, also, the castle has been rebuilt since World War II, uh, but it gives you very much, of course, the impression of the 19th century today. That's why I want to show you the interior courtyard, which is also restored. We are in the finishing, about to finish the inner, the rest of renovation of the courtyard. Um, you can see that it must have been a beautiful castle, Renaissance castle in the 16th century. Uh, and here an aerial view of the uh, important um, places. So on the upper right corner, here, this is the castle that we just saw. Uh, opposite uh, of the castle is the famous Semper Opera, uh, the opera house uh, that is very, that's probably even better known than the museums, I don't know. Um, and this complex here is the Zwinger. Uh, and actually this part here, um, is the Gemälde Galerie uh, uh, and, the script, and where now also the Scriptur and Sammlung has found its new home. Uh, the Zwinger uh, also houses other museums, and I will tell you this in a second, but just to give you an uh, idea uh, of the um, whole physical or geographical situation. So this is the inside of the Zwinger constructed um, in the time of Augustus the Strong. Uh, um, and um, of course, um, the architect was the famous Daniel Pöppelmann and the, um, the sculptures that you can see here were executed by Balthasar Permoser and Paul Herrmann. So it's just a big pleasure ground. It was never, um, uh, it, it never should be a place where you would live uh, or whatever you would do anything, but it's just sort of a big framework for spectacular festivities that they celebrated in there. Um, and so it, um, this sort of um, complex was then finished uh, off in the 19th century with this sort of very um, big rectangular block uh, of the old master paintings gallery. Um, it reminds many people of the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, uh, not by accident, uh, but simply because it was constructed by the same architect. Um, so this building, the whole building was always um, uh, referred to as Gemälde Galerie. So we, when, you, when you speak in Dresden, I'm going to the Gemälde Galerie, everybody knows that you're going to this building. Uh, and we now, since there's also the sculpture on display, like to refer to it now to the Semper Gallery or the Semper Bau, so like the Semper Opera, uh, uh, we, we call it now the Semper Gallery. Um, and of course, you know, I have to show you this world famous paintings like the Sistine Madonna by Raphael or the famous Holy Night by Correggio. So the paintings, old master paintings gallery had really um, a stupendous, um, a stupendous collection and is very well known. Uh, so um, here is a little overview of um, what, um, what you can find under the name Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden. There are more than, there are 15 museums that work under this umbrella uh, and they are situated in different buildings. And this can be a little bit confusing for other, for people who are not familiar with it. So in the castle, you find the green vault with the treasury. Then you find the, um, uh, the prince cabinet, the coin cabinet and the spectacular armory. 
Uh, then in the Zwinger, you find the old master paintings gallery, the sculpture collection until 1800, and um, the uh, collection of porcelain, which is overwhelming. I totally love it. And then also another collection, which is fantastic, um, which is the Mathematische Physikalische Salon, uh, which is devoted to um, in uh, astronomical and scientific instruments. Then there is another building, it's called the Albertinum, uh, and there is a, a paintings gallery of the new masters of modern art. Uh, so everything, sculpture and paintings after 1800, like for example, the famous collection of Caspar David Friedrich uh, is in the Albertinum. And then there is also the beautiful castle of Pilnitz, a little bit of outside of Dresden with the Museum for Arts and Crafts. So uh, it's really, um, there's really quite a lot going on. Mostly there are people confuse the green vault and the sculpture collection, but we are two, we are with two separate museums. Um, I will explain more about this later. So uh, the Albertinum, uh, this is the building on the Brühl Terrace. So you walk probably 10 minutes, it's not far um, to the Schloss and to the Zwinger from here. Used to be the old armory uh, of the city and was transformed in the 19th century to a museum building that was actually devoted exclusively to sculpture. And uh, you still can see on the entrance Skulptur Sammlung. Uh, and this was really quite a phenomenal collection. You see here old um, installation views from 1903 and 1932, uh, because it encompassed not only the collection of Greek and Roman antiquities and the collection of Renaissance and Baroque sculpture, but also a world famous collection of plaster casts. I already mentioned them in connection with Mengs, uh, but that um, uh, plaster cast collection from the, sixth, uh, from the 18th century was continued on a grand scale during the 19th and 20th century. And um, there were, um, we still have more than 5,000 plaster casts. So the Albertinum wanted to be in the 19th century, a museum that showed the in development of the entire sculpture from antiquity to the present. This is also forgotten. So this must have been spectacular. And that's why when they couldn't have the original, they bought the plaster cast so that you can see the works by Donatello and by Michelangelo. And then uh, you can continue. Um, Albert Dresden was, for example, also the first um, uh, museum in Europe that bought works by Auguste Audin. Uh, and so it was really um, uh, the collecting in the 19th century of this Kultur and Sammlung was um, most impressive. Um, unfortunately, plaster cast collections today um, are, are difficult, you know, in a, in a time when people can travel uh, and see originals. Plaster casts are not so popular anymore. Unfortunately, the greatest part of our plaster cast collection is in storage uh, and you can't see it and that's a great pity. Um, but um, let's start um, at the beginning um, about how the collection of sculpture came together in Dresden. And um, the beginning was in the 16th century uh, with another Augustus. I don't know whether they always have, must have the same name. Uh, he's the Augustus without a number. He's just Elector Augustus. Uh, and uh, in the left side, you see him in this wonderful uh, portrait um, by uh, Kranach. Uh, and on the right side um, uh, in this um, um, medallion, um, which was executed by one of the many North Italian sculptors and that were working in Dresden um, uh, in the 16th century. Uh, it's quite interesting. In the beginning of the 16th century, it was mostly artists from North Italy uh, that were called to Dresden. Um, if you ever heard anything about Giovanni Battista Paperto, please let me know. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, he's, the, the, he's one of the many uh, uh, sculptors uh, um, that from, from um, North Italy that worked in Dresden at this time. Um, and uh, uh, towards the end of the 16th century, the focus would turn to Florence, but in the beginning it was North Italy. Uh, so here we have Elector Augustus, and he was the founder of the famous Kunstkammer in Dresden. Um, we don't know precisely when it was established, so more or less 1560. So this is the starting point for serious collecting in Dresden. 
Uh, and then uh, we have his son, the son of uh, Augustus, uh, Christian I, who ruled unfortunately only for a very short time, uh, but was also very important for the collection because Saxony at that time uh, became a serious political player in Europe. Uh, he had, they were very close to the emperor. And this is why uh, other princes wanted to be good friends with the Saxon electors. Uh, and when Christian I ascended to the throne in 1586, uh, spectacular presents were sent to Dresden uh, in order, yes, to, to become good friends. Uh, and, uh, for example, the Duke of Mantova, Guglielmo Gonzaga, extended as a gift uh, this famous bronze by Filarete, uh, the small bronze that is a, a reduction uh, uh, of the famous antique equestrian monument of Marcus Aurelius, which stands in the, on the Capitoline Hill. Uh, and um, this was a gift that came directly from Mantua to Dresden in 1586. This is so an, such an important piece because it's the oldest small bronze we know. Uh, you can see on the left side the very um, interesting inscription uh, on, the, on, the, on the, this sort of plaquette that it's mounted on. Um, and so we know exactly when Filarete made it. So he made it in Rome uh, when he was working on the bronze doors uh, for um, uh, St. Peter's. Uh, and so uh, we have really the founding piece sort of the whole genre uh, in Dresden. Other gifts that Christian received were these, also not a bad batch. Uh, so Francesco de' Medici sent these three uh, spectacular bronzes by Giambologna uh, to Dresden. Uh, and this was topped by a gift from Giambologna himself. So Giambologna gave as a present to Christian I his famous statue of Mars. Uh, and this is also quite interesting that um, you see the, the, uh, how famous Giambologna was already at this point, because he could afford to give a present to a prince, and he was sure that it would be uh, enthusiastically received. So this is quite an interesting story also about the um, 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 position in society of an artist at that time. Christian knew perfectly how one should behave in such a situation. And of course, he didn't send any money to Giambologna, but sent him a present himself, which was a beautiful golden chain executed by a goldsmith in Dresden. And we have all the receipts and all the documents about this uh, still in our archives. So um, the Mars, unfortunately, being a personal gift to the, uh, um, uh, to the elector, remained um, in the possession of the Bettine family uh, when they abdicated uh, in 1918. Uh, and they sold it then very quickly in the, um, in the 1920s. Um, it went through a couple of hands. Uh, and only in 1588, uh, it was given as a present to, of all things or persons, to the pharmaceutical company of Bayer in Leverkusen. Uh, and so this spectacular piece was in their art collection in the office building of, in Leverkusen. Uh, and uh, it was only two years ago that we learned rather by accident that it was to be sold at um, Sotheby's uh, in London. Uh, here you see the auction catalog, an entire separate auction catalog that was only devoted to this piece. Um, and um, this was um, quite exciting and uh, uh, um, a lot of negotiations then went on uh, and it was literally one day before the auction that we could come to a private arrangement and were able to get uh, uh, the mask back to Dresden, uh, and here you see <laughs> a shot from the op uh, from the opening when it was presented. So um, uh, this was um, quite. It was probably the best moment in my life, and I will never ever uh, um, um, will have um, any similar experience. So this um, was just a dream come true that the mask returned to Dresden. 
Um, and here I want to show you the inventory uh, of the Kunstkammer. So all these Giambologna sculptures that I just showed to you um, arrived in Dresden in 1586. And in 1587, Christian ordered that a, um, a proper inventory was uh, to be written up. And these are the first pages from the section devoted to sculpture. Uh, and uh, uh, here you can see, for example, uh, number this number here, which is the, uh, um, the, the, the statuette of Mars, but given by Johann Polonia, Giovanni Bologna, uh, 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 to um, the elector. And uh, so all these um, sculptures are in here in this um, inventory, which is the first Kunstkammer inventory in Europe. So it's the oldest one uh, of Europe. Um, and um, this gives you also an idea about what is perhaps the, one of the greatest assets of the collection in Dresden, that is the um, incredible documentation. Um, the provenances of most of the pieces go more or less directly back to the artist who created the object himself. Uh, and um, uh, I was very spoiled because I worked for 10 years in Vienna, which also has pretty good in, in regard to the provenances of the pieces, but um, Dresden is absolutely on the same level. Uh, sometimes even, you know, um, even older and even better when, we, when it comes to documentation. Um, during the 17th century, um, the odd pieces here and there were bought, uh, artists were, um, uh, were called to work in Dresden, but then it really gets hot uh, with Baron Raymond Leplat. Uh, Le Pla was the art agent of Augustus the Strong. Uh, you see him here in this fantastic uh, uh, bust by Jean-Louis Lemoine. You see again a French artist because it's still, you know, also Le Pla is French, uh, so everything has to be French. Uh, and Le Pla now starts to go shopping. He went shopping uh, and he went, made many trips to Italy, uh, to Venice, to Rome. It was him who negotiated uh, the acquisition of two spectacular collections of antique sculpture in Rome, the collection of the family Chigi and of the Albani family um, that he bought en bloc uh, so that Augustus would also have a proper collection of antiquities. Um, he was twice in Paris to buy bronze uh, and we have all the letters, all his um, uh, communication, uh, his um, precise description of the pieces. It's everything there. So um, the documents from the shopping trips um, uh, are really spectacular. You know, when we make today a shopping list, it's like milk, butter, sugar, and there it reads like a bronze by a bronze like this, an antiquity. But it's, so it's it's. Um, uh, this is fantastic to work with. So Le Pla um, bought, for ex uh, as I told you, these uh, collections um, uh, in Rome, uh, and there was no space for them to house them. So um, when they arrived in Dresden, they were displayed in the Palais in the Grand Garden. Uh, another one of these pleasure houses that Augustus had. Uh, he never lived there. It was just a palace um, uh, um, for fun uh, in a big garden that it sort of central park of Dresden. Uh, and in the front, you see another sculpture um, because of course there were also everything, the parks and so had to be equipped um, by, by nice sculptures. This is Pietro Balestra, for example, uh, who like Corradini in Venice sent, you know, like, dozens of sculptures to dress them. Um, yes, uh, and here you have now the rooms that is devoted to small bronzes in the green vault. Uh, and this is another side of the whole historic development of the collection of sculptures in Dresden, because um, some you know, part of the collection simply was used also to decorate the palaces um, and um, also the palaces in Poland, for example, Augustus the Strong was also king of Poland. Um, and so everything that was not in the green world, uh, then in the 19th century, uh, become, became part of the collect of, of the Skulpturensammlung. This is why uh, something like a hundred small bronzes are today in the green world, and the other hundred are in the Skulpturensammlung.
Uh, even the four bronzes by Gian Bologna from 1586, two are in the green vault and two are in my collection. So um, it's completely haphazard how this division was made. Um, and um, uh, this makes it very difficult for an outsider to understand uh, for which, you know, which objects are in the responsibility, uh, in the responsibility of which collection. Um, so um, um, the other thing that happened then uh, uh, um, was about 10 years ago, um, that it was decided that the uh, Albertinum uh, should become a museum for modern art. Uh, and so the Skulpturensammlung was divided radically at 1800. Uh, so everything um, before 1800 is Skulpturensammlung and everything after 1800 is now part of the Albertinum. So all this reconstruction and reorganization and renovation work that was all gone led to the rather sad situation that the Skulpturensammlung for many, many years was displayed as you see it here on the, on the screen. Uh, everything put together in, in vitrines and yes, sort of visible, but without proper labeling, without proper lightning. Uh, so this was um, Renaissance and Baroque sculpture. Uh, and this was the um, uh, so-called um, uh, glass storage uh, with the um, greatest part of the Greek and Roman antiquities. Um, and this situation now had to be remedied. Uh, and um, with the renovation of the Semper Gallery, new spaces in the gallery were had to be found, had to be created in order to give a new display to these uh, collections. Um, very splendidly now in the East Hall uh, ground stairs uh, of the Semper Bau is the display of Greek and Roman antiquities. It's absolutely spectacular, big, we have space and we have light. There are big windows on both sides uh, that we can open uh, and uh, it's a sun drenched room and, uh, um, and the antiquities looks just amazing when you see um, um, how they are placed here. Um, so this is um, fantastic. That was always planned in, in that way um, because already Semper had designed this particular hall for sculpture. Uh, but he wanted to have the plaster casts displayed here, uh, which also um, was the case for a couple of years. Uh, and now sculpture has returned to these rooms and one can really see that they were designed for this sort of display. Um, and the plaster casts, at least those uh, from Manx, also found a new home. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any actual photographs. So this is just during installation. Um, they are installed now in an enfilade of three rooms, uh, also on the ground floor, which is a little bit like an academy so that people can walk in and uh, uh, make drawings, hopefully, and study the antiquities and, and uh, be inspired by them. Um, Yes, and then we had to find a place for Renaissance and Baroque sculpture. Uh, and that was not so easy um, because, as, yes, we wanted from the beginning to have them in dialogue with uh, the paintings, but we also needed a proper space, you know, this. Um, uh, and so the, my, our director had them um, um, at that time revolutionary, almost, you know, um, um, uh, heretic idea to. Um, use the former Bellotto corridor for sculpture. Uh, you see, um, uh, only one half of this corridor in the first floor, uh, with the paintings, you know, some of the most beautiful vedutas by Bellotto. Uh, and it's quite impressive how um, a room full with such spectacular works of art can look so depressing. Uh, and it was the light, of course. Light is everything. So this is how the room looks when you uh, open the windows. And then we also got rid of the absolutely charming chandeliers, which were 1950s or something. And this is how it looks now. Uh, so again, a, a sort of loggia. It almost gives the feeling of a loggia when you are in a Roman palazzo, um, when the sun comes in in the afternoon. Uh, this is really a room to enjoy sculpture uh, and uh, 
just by, be overwhelmed by uh, um, um, how they look in the different light. Uh, here is another view of the room um, where you can see really how the sun comes in and transforms everything. Um, other impressions of how uh, how wonderfully one can look uh, at them. And um, I'm also very happy because we have um, we are able to show uh, many, many pieces without cases uh, so that you have as good as an experience uh, in looking. Uh, you're not allowed to touch, but you can look and see them very closely. Uh, of course, there is also proper electric lighting now, so that in the evenings uh, or night openings, um, um, we can uh, also see them. So it's not, we're not depending entirely on sunshine alone. Um, and uh, here's some of the dialogues we created. Uh, on, uh, and it's really, um, it, it keeps amazing me on what a high artistic level we could play here. Uh, so you have a painting by Andrea del Sarto, for example, and mm -hmm. next to it, we place this spectacular bronze reproduction of the uh, Laocon group, uh, since quite obviously, um, Isaac, the son, you can see, is in the uh, position of his body and um, designed after one of the sons of Laocon. Uh, and just in putting these pieces next to each, um, this, you know, the painting and the sculpture next to each other, people can make this connection. Of course, there is also, um, we have uh, always texts and labels and audio guides that explain this, but in cases like these, um, people are invited just to look, and I think most of them get it, what this is about. Uh, another of uh, those um, pieces we have are, um, um, great fun, uh, spectacular um, painting by Rembrandt, Ganymede, and to which we, um, next to it, we placed this a little head uh, of a crying puto, which is by Hendrik de Kaiser. So both artists were working in Amsterdam um, uh, and um, Rembrandt is um, um, uh, younger than de Kaiser, but from the inventories of Rembrandt collection, it appears that he owned such a puttu by Hendrik de Kaiser. Uh, but I think it's most of all this particular sense of humor that you can find uh, in Northern art. Um, it's a little bit sometimes disrespectful in regard to um, Antique uh, to the tradition, because you see that Ganymede here, Rembrandt is re representing Ganymede as a crying toddler who even pees in his panties. So, <laughs> uh, and so having next to it this crying little baby um, uh, uh, um, is also a very nice, um, um, and also sort of from the from the contents behind, meaningful, but also um, it's incredibly popular people. People just love it. Uh, we had, we were a, a while not sure if this is okay, what we're doing here. So we tried it out for a while uh, and the response was very good uh, in terms of, you know, you need a little bit in between just to loosen up uh, um, and um, um, to invite people to, know that looking at art should be a joy. Uh, it's not something serious where you have to, um, you know, think all the time or read all the time, but um, the pleasure that comes from looking uh, was very much guiding our, um, 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 uh, our whole um, installation. Um, another example um, is here, the room uh, that is devoted to Rubens. Uh, and we uh, were able to have this uh, beautiful Silenus uh, installed here in front of Rubens paintings of, with all the satires. Um, this, um, we know that Rubens uh, saw this particular sculpture when he was in Rome because that Silenus comes from the Kiji collection. And now you see the paint and the, the drawing that Rubens made after it when he saw the piece in Rome. And uh, the drawing is in the British um, library today. Um, but so you actually see the antiquity that Rubens saw that inspired him. Uh, and this gives is a very forceful reminder uh, that also Rubens, of course, uh, studied antiquity. It's not something that's so obvious all the time. Um, when you look at his paintings, you above all see, um, you know, the Baroque, the, uh, the artist of the Baroque, uh, but uh, that Rubens is such an impressive artist um, 
is also, of course, because he studied antiquity so carefully. Uh, and this is the point where I want to switch uh, to, um, um, to make a little, oh, let's do it again. Okay. Are we now in the gallery? Can everybody, I hope everybody, Andrea, can you give me a sign if it's visible? Yeah. Uh, just to make you, um, take you a little bit to our galleries. Uh, and uh, we are entering now uh, the Italian wing, one part of the um, um, reconstruction um, was that um, we have now colored wall, wall uh, hangings again, um, so that everybody knows when you are in the red rooms, it's Italian art. The green rooms are Netherlandish arts. The blue rooms are French. So that gives the visitor a little bit of a help of what you can see. Uh, on the left side, very famously, you see the tribuna, uh, the famous tribuna, this octagonal room uh, in the center of the building that was constructed, of course, um, after the model of the tribuna in Florence. And when you are up here, you have a unbelievable uh, vista through the whole gallery where you um, can see uh, uh, the Sistine Madonna at the end uh, of these three big galleries devoted to Italian painting. Um, but I want to stay with you here in this room of Italian art uh, because I want to show you uh, uh, another of these dialogues that we were able to create. So, um, oops, here you have another one of, um, incredibly famous paintings, uh, Giorgione's Sleeping Venus, and right next to it, uh, the paintings by Titian. And here we were able to, uh, whoops, no, I'm gone, sorry. This is still, uh, we, are, we are still working with this, uh, but here this relief, uh, which was one of the things that one could just find in storage. Uh, in, in Dresden. Um, there are incredible discoveries to be made uh, in the scripture and Sammlung. Um, some of the famous works uh, uh, like the Filarete, Marcus Aurelius, were known to people, um, but um, many of the other pieces are have never been properly published. And so um, it was not known that we have um, here in Dresden this really, really wonderful relief, uh, which looks like a Tullio Lombardo. It's, it's of a incredible quality uh, and has a fantastic provenance that goes more or less directly back to the Vendramin collection in Venice. Uh, so the, when you look at it, you can see the quality and then you have the, provi um, the provenance to back it up. Uh, and it's just beautiful to have it here um, next to the paintings because the, the profile of the lady on the red leaf and the profile of the lady in the painting by Titians uh, is almost the same. Um, and you see the um, um, very poetic approach the Venetian artists had to uh, antiquity. Um, you see also the problems one has in installing such things. Um, we sort of had to create a little bit of a backdrop so that the um, the equilibrium of the entire wall was uh, was okay, so that um, uh, sort of she is uh, the counterweight to the famous lady in white uh, by Titian. Um, it took quite some time to come to these arrangements, also because um, our colleagues in um, the paintings curators, of course, had to give up prime real estate. Um, but it was clear from the beginning that um, it's the sculpture should not be something that you put into an empty corner, but it should be really um, uh, um, art that could communicate on the, on the same level with each other. Uh, and this is something that we continue to do also in our exhibitions. Um, and uh, this is why I want to go with you now here, the room of the 17th century. Uh, and this is now a rather unusual view because this crucifix that you can see here in the back usually isn't there. Uh, we just installed this for a little exhibition that we opened uh, uh, in December, but being closed, nobody could see it so far. Um, but uh, this is something of the interventions we try to do. Um, so, um, I'm walk you around a little bit. Uh, so we are now in the room full with the most spectacular altar paintings of the Italian Renaissance by 
Raphael, of course, uh, and by Correggio, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, and um, what we wanted to show with this um, display, this is something we can do because we have um, our plaster cast collection. Uh, and in this plaster cast collection, oops, sorry, I don't want to show you the ceiling here. Um, we have a cast that was one of the first casts that was bought in the 19th century of Donatello's crucifix in the Santo in Padova. Um, and this sort of should evoke the original display of Raphael's uh, Madonna in uh, Piacenza. Uh, Raphael's Madonna was um, the altar painting in San Sisto in Piacenza, uh, which was a church from a monastery. So um, you had um, a, a division between the choir where the monks were sitting and the part that was uh, uh, where, the, where the general public um, um, participated in mass. And on this division, uh, um, there uh, used to be a crucifix on top of it. This is something that you can, that also was the case for the Donatello crucifix in Padua. Originally, this was the first commission that Donatello uh, executed in Padua, the crucifix for the, uh, um, uh, for this, for the choir screen. And only then he executed the main altar. Uh, and today the crucifix is together with the figures on the main altar and it has nothing to do with the way uh, how um, the choir looked, uh, of the Santo looked like in the 15th and 16th century. Um, one of the choir screens that are still in place where you can see this arrangement is the Frari church in Venice where you have the choir screen with the crucifix on top and in the back you see the Assunta by Titian. And very much this way was the situation in Piacenza. And this is very important to understand some of the most um, astonishing um, uh, elements of the Sistine Madonna. Um, oops, now it's getting a little bit too reflections. Now let's go back, this is not good. Um, because um, the Madonna and the child, and this has always been noted, um, they look scared. Uh, the baby has the eyes open, big, and I said, oh, oh my God. And also the Madonna is looking at something. And you also have this gesture of San Sistus with his finger here, he's pointing. And so or he was pointing in the church towards the crucifix. Uh, so the green curtain that reveals the Madonna to us also reveals to the Madonna and the baby their fate so that Christ will end up on the crucifix. And this is why they look so scared. Um, an absolute, um, um, normally uh, in all the Madonna paintings in the, in the uh, 15th and 16th century, even when there are allusions to um, the passion of Christ, the baby is always accepting it happily. Nobody is ever unhappy about what is going to happen. Uh, so um, um, Jesus is receiving, for example, the little bird as a symbol for the passion and is accepting it quietly. Never ever is he scared. Uh, so Raphael is giving this unbelievably human touch to his Madonna. And this is probably one of the reasons why this painting is still so incredibly popular, why people want to see it. Yes, it is very famous because of the two angels, no doubt. But when you observe the visitors coming into this room, you know, the tourists stomping up, just you know, like in the Louvre where everybody wants to see the Mona Lisa. So in Dresden, everybody wants to see the Sistine Madonna. And in the moment they are in this room, they shut up. They get quiet and are completely enchanted. Um, and even in our secular times, it's um, amazing to observe uh, the effect uh, the Madonna has um, on the visitors. Uh, and so for a certain time period, we have this juxtaposition uh, and um, hope that people um, um, can appreciate it. So uh, um, when you walk through here, uh, you are in the sculpture gallery. Um, and uh, I show you here this view of the sculpture gallery. Um, and here we just talked about this. 
Um, and uh, next to the Laocoon here and Andrea del Sato there with the sun, um, with Isaac having a sort of, is composed in the same way like the son of Laocoon. We're also having this uh, magnificent bronze here. Oh, Jesus, always when I'm doing this, no, I must stand here. Okay, now I get it. Um, the spectacular bronze, mm, great mystery, um, probably Siena, 1495. It's usually attributed to Francesco di Giorgio and I do believe into this and this attribution, um, but we don't know what the sculpture depicts. It's probably Laocoon too. Uh, and when we think that it was um, um, executed uh, in 1495, it means um, it is a Laocon before the actual Laocon group was found, which happened only in 1506. So perhaps Francesco di Giorgio had this idea of how the story of Laocon was depicted. Uh, and this is just one of the many enigmatic and um, interesting um, sculptures that you find in Dresden. And now I can only hope that I have seduced you sufficiently. And the moment we reopen, you will all come and visit. Uh, and I will see you precisely here in the Sculpture Gallery. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are questions, I'm most happy to answer. Uh, and I can only hope that you have enjoyed our little trip through, uh, through Dresden. Grazie davvero, Claudia, grazie. È magnifico quello che ci hai fatto vedere, chiarissima la, la storia complicata dei musei a Dresda e è davvero magnifico questo, questo nuovo allestimento dove la scultura dialoga con la pittura e dove appunto effettivamente l'idea di questa galleria con le finestre, quindi anche con la luce naturale, è, è magnifica. Quindi siete riusciti a esporre, diciamo, una buona parte della, della, della collezione di sculture. Sì, veramente tanti, ci sono naturalmente sempre um, una 10, 20 oggetti che direi, ah, vorrei vedere, fa vedere anche questo, uh, ma si deve sempre fare una scelta, è chiaro. E, um, um, e per questo abbiamo um, anche uno spazio per fare mostre, proprio qui, uh, uh, nel primo piano abbiamo un, um, uh, la possibilità di fare piccole interventioni, si vede scultura dappertutto. Ups, devo andare qui. Adesso siamo nei cabinetti, eh, con, uh, si vede, up, andiamo qui. Ecco. Ah, così posso farvi vedere anche una mia una stanza che adoro particolarmente le pitture di uh, Poussin con questo fantastico uh, busto di Cordier. Eh, per dare una idea dei artisti francesi, per esempio, che lavorano a Roma a questo momento. Uh, ecco, e si vede uh, pittura francese, il muro è blu. Uh, ecco. E questa è una nostra sala per... Uh, ma cosa è successo adesso? Ah, per... Uh, questo non è ancora parte dell'allestimento, um, per fare interventioni. Uh, eh, e qui in questa sala possiamo fare piccole mostre su un oggetto, su qualcosa di particolare, e così si può far vedere anche i pezzi amati che sono in, ancora in deposito. <ride> No, no, un'idea molto intelligente, no? bellissima, veramente bellissima queste gallerie. Quando è che è aperto così il museo? Ecco, il museo è aperto, ha uh, aperto l'anno scorso, uh, febbraio 28. Uh, <ride> <ride> ed eravamo aperti per tre settimane e poi il lockdown. Era tragedia. E certo, no, no, vabbè, ma speriamo di vederlo. Assolutamente presto. Perché... Noi aspettiamo, ma era veramente frustrante perché abbiamo lavorato, io ho lavorato quattro anni, i miei colleghi che sono da, hanno lavorato da dieci anni su questo riallestimento delle sculture antiche um, e dopo tutto questo, uh, um, due, sai, aperto, uh, la inaugurazione, due settimane aperto e poi 
<ride> eh, non abbiamo ancora avuto il sentimento che abbiamo fatto questo, è finito. Manca un po' per noi. <ride> eh no, certo, viene molta voglia. Io non so se qualcuno del pubblico, visto che ci sono molti amici, molti colleghi, vogliono eh, farti delle domande. Credo che possano azionare il... Ecco, vedo... Ah, vedi. Ti fai vedere. Intanto faccio vedere anche un po' um, il, il resto della... So così. Questo è il primo piano della galleria, uh, dove si vede bello nel centro la tribuna. Um, e proprio è, è molto classico perché una ala è italiana e l'altra è... Um, Uh, um, um, olandese fiamminga uh, um, e per esempio qui nella tribuna si ha questo che è molto si ha questo vista spettacolare e tu devi deciderti dove andare <ride> se cominci con la arte um, uh, italiana o se vai verso uh, la, um, la arte fiamminga e poi c'è ancora il secondo piano <ride> Vedo che c'è una, do una domanda, vedo nella chat di Enrica Cecco, okay. te la leggo, dice cosa pensa del tour virtuale che ha usato nella presentazione, pensa che è qualcosa di buono, qualcosa che tiene ah. i visitatori, o dice potrebbe essere una soluzione per le opere d'arte nei depositi? Uh, francamente, uh, sì, eh, eh, noi abbiamo parlato tanto su questo soggetto, anche quando hanno fatto questo possibilità di fare una visita virtuale al museo um, che è una, una bella cosa ma um, soprattutto in un momento quando sei fermo a casa ma infatti no uh, e io ho, ho, sono, ho un po' paura che così la gente um, dimentica che proprio godere arti si ha bisogno dell'originale uh, e si vede che la qualità um, um, visuale è abbastanza alta ma non credo che quando sei di fronte un muro così pieno di stupende opere di Van Dyck um, uh, um, che puoi veramente entrare in un dialogo con l'opera d'arte Um, spero, e ho un po' paura che se lavoriamo troppo con questo museo virtuale, um, um, che la gente non viene più in museo, ma questo è essenziale. Io spero al contrario che avere questa esperienza um, fa curioso mm. e poi la gente vuole vedere la cosa reale e forse anche questo sarà una, una cosa che dopo tutti questi mesi che noi adesso dobbiamo restare a casa forse ancora di più c'è questa voglia di uscire la, il, il mondo virtuale e vedere le cose reali. Ah, penso proprio di sì, penso proprio di sì. No, a me sembra veramente molto bello. Ma quindi i Giambologna, i bronzi di Giambologna, Mercurio, sono un po' ancora Grünes Gewölbe e qualcosa hai tu, insomma. E quindi sono, sono una galleria? Sì, due sono, um, uh, um, due sono nel Grünes Gewölbe, il Mercurio e l'Ariadne. Oh, adesso siamo nel primo, secondo piano, come ho fatto questo. Um, um, e... Um, Oh, no, non funziona. E, e due sono nella scrittura Samlong, sì. Uh, gli, erano tutti uniti naturalmente quando il Marte è arrivato uh, e abbiamo avuto una bellissima uh, mostra soltanto sul Giambologna e abbiamo anche avuto um, due o tre altri Marti um, per, um, um, per vedere le differenze del ghetto e di vedere la qualità altissima uh, uh, di questo Marte di Dresda. Um, e, ma questa era soltanto una riunione troppo corta e, e poi adesso siamo, sono separati di nuovo. Um, 
anche in questo non, non credo è una cosa che possiamo trovare una soluzione, cosa fare. Uh, ma per mostre si può riunire um, gruppi di oggetti che devono essere assieme. Per esempio abbiamo anche un gruppo spettacolare di opere francesi di Lespingola. Uh, <ride> uh, e sono qualche... E nel, nel, nel mio museo e gli altri sono um, nelle... nella divisione è così no però certo per chi come me aveva visto una decina d'anni fa che molte di queste sculture erano all'albertinum in queste casse di vetro in queste vetrine tutte stipate certo è un come dire, è, è meraviglioso come le vediamo adesso. E poi tu mi dicevi che in questo momento voi avete anche un'altra scultura barocca importante, il Mocchi. Eh... Ah, <ride> non credo che adesso posso farvi vedere. Uh, 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 uh. No, Però è nel museo adesso comunque. Uh, uh, sì, abbiamo, um, uh, perché assieme con la collezione Col um, Kigi, mm. uh, uh, che era una collezione soprattutto di, di, di statua antica, erano anche sei opere moderne. Eh, e uno è abbastanza importante perché è il San Giovanni eh, eh, di Francesco Mocchi, eh, che è stato infatti eh, eh, fatto per il Papa, per la cap Cappella Barberini eh, in San Andrea della Valle. E, uh, e poi uh, non è mai messo uh, a quest in questo luogo uh, e um, finiva nella collezione dei Chigi uh, e così um, uh, andava questa opera importantissima della scultura barocca romana a Dresda uh, e, e, um, sempre, um, e poi Agosto decide che è una tale opera naturalmente meglio Uh, uh, non è una cosa che si mette nel castello, ma si mette nella um, chiesa cattolica. Uh, Agosto doveva diventare cattolico per, essere, um, per diventare il re di Polonia. E così c'è accanto um, del castello um, la um, chiesa cattolica, uh, che era la cattedrale co del corte. Uh, e qui, per tutti questi anni, Proprio dormiva questa scultura di San Giovanni, um, nessuno la conosceva uh, e ci siamo riusciti per esempio per questa mostra uh, di Caravaggio e sul tempo che abbiamo avuto in autunno uh, di portare uh, il San Giovanni um, e, e um, è camminato per la piazza. <ride> Um, per um, una volta presentarlo nel museo. Um, possiamo studiarlo, e questa era una bella cosa, fare delle belle foto, di, di fare tutte le ricerche, è stato ripulito, ma adesso ritornerà nella chiesa. Sono molto triste. <ride> ma è giusto così. Um, eh, era un'opera fatta per la chiesa e così. Certo, certo. Ci sono nella chat degli altri complimenti per il nuovo allestimento, molto belli piedistalli in legno scuro, eh, quindi piacciono tutti. E non so se qualcuno vuole fare domande, credo si possa anche parlare. Eh. Sono tutti stra ammirati e vogliono tutti venire a Dresda, Claudio. Ah, bene, bene, bene. <ride> non vedo l'ora. <ride> e vedere finalmente tutte queste cose, no? Veramente complimenti perché... Nel frattempo posso farvi vedere anche un'altra cosa, per esempio questo uh, ups, dipinto di, di Rubens, mm -hmm. abbiamo due volte, una volta <ride> la, uh, il Rubens... Um, uh, um, um, fatto lui stesso e una volta la scuola uh, e così abbiamo una volta questo dipinto nella galleria uh, um, e um, questo, la seconda esecuzione solo della bottega di Rubens è nel corridoio uh, per um, fare confrontare con questo bellissimo uh, uh, Ercole qui è ubriaco perché ci bacco con il vino <ride> e sono sempre queste piccole famiglie che, um, che danno una storia assieme qui Ercole uh, uccide Cacco e, e qui abbiamo um, il busto di bacco di Paul Herman di questo artista che ha fatto anche il ritratto di Augusto e accanto c'è un bacco antico 
Uh, così ci sono tanti tanti di questi um, um, dialoghi fra diverse opere d'arte uh, che formano sempre una forma di famiglia. Uh, qui in questa zona abbiamo più le opere um, sacrale e poi abbiamo per esempio un, un, un angolo dove è soprattutto la storia di Apollo uh, in diverse modificazioni. Uh, Apollo e Daphne, Apollo e, um, e, e um, come si chiama adesso? Non mi viene in mente. Ecco. Uh. Apollo e Marzia. Eh, grazie. <ride> sì. E così via. E, e poi qui anche i um, rilievi sono uh, no, di Apollo, uh, forse di Parod, uh, e così. O qui anche una bella, bella, bella cosa, uh, il... Um, uh, Fauno danzante di Adriano di Fris con un fauno danzante dell'antico. Dell uh, è, è bellissimo di avere questo, um, questo dialogo sì, che poi sì. di fronte alle finestre. No. Questo è veramente vogliamo che, uh, di aiutare um, che la gente capisce come tutto è relato a uno all'altro, uh, che un'opera d'arte non esiste in un vacuum, non, non, non è stato creato in un vacuum. Um, e... Assolutamente, no, poi lo sappiamo bene che adesso questo è, è un momento dove la maggior parte del pubblico preferisce l'arte contemporanea, <ride> in Germania credo lo, lo, lo sapete molto, e, e credo che sia molto efficace perché poi una cosa che è importante di questo museo è che è un museo non, non è grande come il Louvre, cioè è un museo che si visita molto bene. Sì, insomma, sì, sì. Che... E molto vario. Abbiamo anche un bellissimo caffè, un nuovo caffè. Sì, ecco. sì. <ride> e anche sono delle sculture nel caffè. Ah, Abbiamo così tanti originali. <ride> e si chiama il caffè Algarotti. Ah, vedi? <ride> torniamo al nostro Algarotti. Bene, bene. No, no. Eh, no, veramente, guarda, molti, molti complimenti. E eh, quindi io non so se non ci sono altre domande. Tutti ringraziano, vogliono venire tutti a Dresda, vedo sulla chat. E Claudia, noi ti ringraziamo ancora veramente tantissimo e, e mille complimenti per questo, per questo lavoro che hai fatto al museo, perché è veramente... Con un team fantastico, eh, sono dei colleghi veramente favolosi qui e eh, di lavorare assieme su questo progetto era una delle più belle esperienze di, della mia vita, veramente. Venite a godere con noi. Verremo assolutamente, io saluto tutto il, il pubblico che, che ha ascoltato e ha visto queste cose meravigliose, ringrazio ancora tantissimo eh, Claudia per questa bellissima lezione che ci ha regalato e vi do appuntamento alla settimana prossima, a giovedì prossimo, quando avremo Anlise Demà del Getty Museum di Los Angeles che ci parlerà delle, delle sue collezioni di scultura. Claudia, grazie davvero. Un grazie, ciao. Ciao e grazie a tutti, grazie davvero a tutti. Arrivederci. Ti ringrazio.